I know some of you are ready to get your children back. I'll assume all of you are ready to get your children back. Perhaps you're enjoying the peace and quiet, but some of them are coming back after lunch, so or around lunchtime, so please don't forget to take them home with you, okay? We'd really appreciate that. Um, others are coming back later in the week, but they've had a great time. Had seven to receive Christ yesterday, so we're excited about that, and sure. And um, you'll hear more about some of our mission work uh, that was done last week as we close our service in just a few minutes. So uh, we continue to be in this book of Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter 3 and chapter 4. Uh, today, verses four, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, and it begins, of course, with a therefore. And, and keep in mind, in the Greek language, and in biblical times especially, um, the, the, the text was written, um, we would call it a run-on sentence, okay? Uh, there was no punctuations at all in Scripture. Uh, there was no capitalization, no commas, no, no periods. And if you were to say, uh, let's eat, Grandma, that's one thing. But if you were to say, let's eat grandma, that's a whole different thing. So that little comma uh, can mean a lot, and it does in Scripture. Uh, the, the, the punctuations that we have added later on as we tried to make it more readable, um, but in original language, this, this was written as one run-on sentence. There was not even spacing between each word. Uh, they just, you just keep writing. And no spacing, no punctuation, no chapters, no verses, nothing. It's just a, a glob of letters. But the Greek mind was trained to read through that and find the words and that kind of thing. So when we see that word, therefore, keep in mind that we've just talked about, you remember last week, Paul being the example of Christ and follow my example as I follow Christ. And he encouraged people to follow his walk with the Lord. And what a challenge that was for us to say, hey, look at my life and you can follow what I do in Christ. And then he talked about the citizenship that is in heaven and our citizenship that God has given us and Christ has given us. And as he, as he does that, therefore, he says, my brothers whom I loved and longed for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm for the Lord. Now, at first reading and at last reading, that's the struggle for me because it says that my, my joy and my crown in my life, that there ought to be some joy that you know that's the theme of this verse or this book by now, the joy of the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord. And so now we've got this joy in the Lord and the crown that we receive from Christ for our faithfulness in the Lord and to have joy in our life. And then he says, stand firm. Well, those don't go together because if you're standing firm, you're standing firm, Right. I mean, you got the armor of God on, you got your shield and you got everything. You're standing firm for the Lord. You're standing strong. You're going against the opposition of the world. You're fighting the fight and on and on and on. And he said, let your joy and the crown be in you. How are you going to have joy in your life if you're standing firm, if you're fighting the fight, if you're in the battle of life, how are you going to have joy in your life? He says in verse four, and you see it in verse four, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. He says that over and over in this book, but he follows up that, that standing firm and the joy and the crown to standing firm. And do you remember when you were little, you would pout and you would fuss and maybe mom and dad would sing to you, a cheerful heart is good medicine, good medicine, good medicine. Have you, did mom and dad ever sing that? Oh, what a neglected life y'all have had. I'm coming to the student ministry one Wednesday night and we're singing a cheerful heart, okay? Just so that you'll, but yeah, it, it is. And, and uh, if you don't have a cheerful heart, it's going to dry up your bones. It's going to crush the bones of your life. It's going to be incredible. A cheerful heart really is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So how do we do that? How do we stand firm for the Lord and then have joy and happiness in your life? when you're fighting the fight, when you're being, as Paul would say, poured out like a drink offering and have joy and happiness in your life. Well, one of the things we'll look into this, this story, there was uh, 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 two ladies, Yodia and, and Sinteki, that Paul pled with them. And he pled with them, you see, for, for, to agree with each other in the Lord. So he, he follows that up in verse Four, saying rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say rejoice. Well, why are we saying rejoice in the Lord? Because we have two ladies, and these two ladies are in a fight. And apparently this fight that they were in the middle of was, was, was causing disruption and breaking the harmony of the fellowship. 
And Paul says, plead with these ladies, quit fighting, get along with one another. I remember early in my ministry, <clears throat> like I was, I don't know, probably 28 years old. I was in my first pastorate. This scarred me for life. There was two ladies in the church fighting. As a young kid, I don't want to be involved in a fight with two, two ladies. As an old man, I don't want to be involved in a fight with two ladies. I mean, I just don't want to get in the middle of that. And this was the lady in charge of the flower committee and a lady in charge of WMU. Nothing wrong with WMU, nothing wrong with flowers. But those two ladies were a handful. It doesn't matter what they were in charge of. They were a handful. And they both came to me and said, we want you to settle this. And I thought, oh, mercy. So I did what is my practice and even practice today. When I get stuck, I bring some people around me and say, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. So I got two or three or four guys around me and I said, listen, I've, I've got this lady here. She's in charge of WMU. She thinks this is how we ought to do this. And there's a lady in charge of the flower committee and she thinks we ought to do this. And I don't know what to do. I don't know, I don't know what decision made. They said, oh, pastor, back out of there as quick as you can. You don't get involved in that. It's gonna take you out. What you do, you tell those two ladies to solve the problem and let you know the answer and you get out of the way. And I said, I'm gonna do that. That's what Paul's doing here. These two ladies are having, can't you wait to get to heaven? If y'all get to heaven this week, go find these ladies if they made it and say, what were y'all fighting about? I mean, what you were dividing the whole church and what were y'all fighting? I don't know what they were fighting about, but something was going on. Plead with them. Be flexible in your relationships. Be flexible in your relationships. He says, uh, agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Plead with these ladies. Get along. Be flexible in their relationships with one another. Because in reality, is Christ not flexible with you in his relationship with you? Do you not know a different Christ than you did when you were six? when you were 16, when you were 26, when you were 36? Aren't you glad that you have a savior that meets you right where you are than circumstances of life and the time that you've been walking with the Lord, the difficulties that are going on in life? Whatever the case may be, God meets you right there. He's flexible with us. Certainly we can be flexible with one another and not stiff-necked that this is my expectation and this is the way it was gonna be, this is right, this is my understanding of scripture, this is how we're gonna get along, this is what you'll, you'll, and you say, well, pastor, it's just the principle of the thing. If that's one of your coring phrases that you like to use, that you're gonna stand on the principle, you're not being flexible in your relationships. Stand on God's grace, stand on his mercy, Stand on his goodness. So just for the fun of it, just for the fun of it, how flexible are you or in your relationships? Are you like a one? I got it. I'm on it. Are you a 10? No, I'm pretty rigid with other people. Just as a side note, the measure you use will be measured to you. And I don't know about you, but when Buddy Champion stands in front of God and asks for forgiveness and asks for grace to enter into the presence of God, I need some grace. Amen? That's a little weak, holier than thou, followers of Christ. We need God's grace in our life. We don't need his judgment. We need his goodness and the cleansing of his blood in our life. So just as a side note, are you a one or are you a ten? You got it or is this something maybe you need to work on in your life? And just as a side note, he said, I plead with Clement, my fellow yoke fellow, whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life, whose name is written in the book of life. I just want to chase a little rabbit for just a few minutes. Is your name written in the book of life? Do you know without a shadow of a, name, shadow of a doubt that if it were a literal book, and perhaps it is, that God goes to the A, B's and the C's and he looks up Buddy or, and certainly it won't be my real name. We'll go with Buddy. And he looks up Buddy and he looks up Champion that my name is right there. 
Is your name in the book of life? Because you see, if your name is in the book of life, then Revelation chapter 20, I think it's verse 15. I looked up this morning, I can't remember the exact. Verse 15, I think it is, is, is that if your name is right, not written into the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, same book, Lamb's book of life, then you will be thrown into the lake of fire. It's imperative you know that your name is written in the book of life. And you say, Pastor, I really don't think there's a, like a lake of fire. I don't, well, maybe there is, maybe there's not. I don't know, but I do know one thing, that Jesus believed there was a lake of fire. He wouldn't have said you'll be thrown into the lake of fire. And I think Jesus, being God, is intellectual enough to know of what he's speaking of, and it's not a lake of fire. It's just total separation from God. That's bad enough, but where he would have said total separation from God. Regardless, you don't want to be there, my friend. There comes a point in your life that you say yes to Jesus, that you're a sinner, and you say yes to Jesus, that I need a Savior. And I recognize Jesus as the Savior of the world for the sacrifice that he made for my sins on the cross. And then your name is written in the book of life. My question is, do you know that your name is written in the book of life? It's imperative. It's where the rest of life begins, theologically and practically. If you don't know that, you can know that today. You just say, yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, he's the Savior. And I ask for his forgiveness in my life and come to be my CEO as I tell our students to be the boss of my life. If there's not that time in your life that you surrendered it to Christ, your name is not in the book of life. So it's just a little phrase thrown in there, the scripture, that gives us an opportunity to jump off of and says, when is your name, when was your name written in the book of life? If you don't know, would you know that today? Just a few minutes, we're gonna close the, the, the time in God's word and I'll give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. I encourage you to do that if you've never done that before. Well, I have questions. You'll always have questions. Well, I have sin in my life. You'll always have sin in your life. The book of life has nothing to do with that. The book of life has to do with you saying yes to Jesus. You get the point. Let's move on. It says, plead with these ladies to, to agree with each other in the Lord. Along with the Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose name are in the book of life. Then we throw in verse four that says, rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. And then he, then he puts this crazy verse in there. It says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Don't forget, the Lord is near. Let your gentleness. Now, some of you are naturally gentle and we don't like you. You're merciful, you're compassionate, you're kind. It just oozes out of your life. And we think you're a fake. No, we don't. We're jealous of that. Some of us, some of us are not gentle. We're a sledgehammer in life and we just speak things and we, we have to total, total, constantly filter what we want to say. People attack us and we strike back and we think, oh, give me the words to say, give me the words to say, give me the words to say. Let your gentleness be evident to all. I looked up that word gentleness. You know what gentleness means? It means gentle. It means kind. Then there was one other description of this word trying to explain that Greek word in English to us. And it said tolerant. And I thought, Saint, I thought mercy. Tolerant. Tolerant that what was sin is not sin anymore. No, 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 no. Tolerant that God meets us where we are. Tolerant that we meet people where they are. Tolerant that even when they lash out at us, that we respond in gentleness because that next verse says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir, stir up anger. A, a gentle answer. Ah, when your student strikes out in calmness, gentleness, when a coach strikes at calmness, gentleness, response. When a student strikes out at you, calmness, gentleness. 
We strike one another. You respond. Will they attack me? Will they accuse me? Will they give us calmness, gentleness? It turns away that wrath and that anger. It will respond in gentleness. Because God meets them where they are. God meets us where we are. We meet people where they are. And let your gentleness be evident to all. And we are gentle in God's presence. Because the Lord is near. Because the Lord is, you, th- you think Santa's watching you. The Lord is watching you. The Lord is within us. He is, he is in our lives and the, the Lord is near in our lives. So how are you doing? How are you doing? If you, are you like a one? That, man, I, yeah, I can respond to gentleness. I can respond in kindness. I can respond in, 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 in calmness. Or are you one that you lash out at me? I'm coming back at you harder. I'm lashing back at you. I'm attacking you personally. No, no, no. Gentle. That's what scripture says. This is how we're going to get along with one another. This is how we're going to get along and we're going to be happy in our lives is that we, we, we respond in gentleness and we're gentle even in while we're in God's presence. So are you like a one? Are you a five? Are you an eight? Are you a 10? Are you always attacking people in your life and uh, with harsh words? Or are you speaking in gentleness in your life? And then there's this dumb verse. It's totally ridiculous. Don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about what? Some things. Don't be anxious about anything. Nothing, anything. Big things, anything. Don't be anxious. Now, remember the Lord is near. That was our last statement, right? And then we didn't put a period on it. just flows right through it, right? That, 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 that's where we are. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. But in what? Everything. Anything and everything? You've got to be kidding me. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, that's even dumber. The things that I'm anxious about, now I'm supposed to have it with, with thanksgiving in my life. Does this make sense to y'all? I mean, this, this is nuts. With thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we practice prayer. We practice prayer to resolve anxiety. Sometimes we just want to go to meds first, don't we? I'm anxious, I can't sleep, give me some meds. I'm anxious, I, sleep, I can't sleep, I'm striking out, everybody give me some meds. Anything wrong with meds? No. God gave us that ability, if you will, that, that um, understanding, that technology. I know it's not technology, but my word's gone. God gave us that to help us in our life and areas of our life. So we just throw prayer out the window. Why don't we pray first, right? Why don't we pray when we're anxious, why don't we pray and continue to pray until we see that? Do you need meds? Perhaps. Don't let it substitute your walk with your creator and your Lord. Don't let us go through life anxious and just not ask God for help, as I often do in my life. I don't have time to pray. I got things to solve. I've got work to do, and we we just push through the things in our life. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me the healing from cancer. Give me a portfolio that I can retire one day or put my kids through school or pay my insurance or whatever. Give, give, give me a husband that loves me and a wife that will follow me. Give, give me a home that... Daily bread? Yeah. Daily bread. You mean the test I've got to take? Yeah. You mean the blue lights in my rear view mirror? Yeah. That'll cause you to pray in a hurry. Won't it? Oh, Lord, please. Yeah. Every, I mean, pray. Don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. 
Big things, little things, silly things, carnal things, worldly things, spiritual things. Pray about everything in your life. But look what it says. Present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. It doesn't make sense. You were busting on me because I don't like this verse. Listen, it transcends all understanding, this verse does. You think you like it? Well, maybe, whatever, it transcends all understanding. But look what will happen. When anxiety comes into our lives, when difficulties come into our lives, it impacts our heart and our mind. It impacts the joy in our soul and our happiness in our life, and it impacts our thinking process. It consumes our thinking process, but it, it, and we'll see how it impacts in just a few minutes. It impacts our thinking process, and it says if, if you'll pray about these things, if you'll lay them before God, he'll, he'll guard your heart. He'll guard your mind. He'll give you, instead of that anxiety in your life, you just continue to pray, continue to pray, continue to pray, continue to pray, and he'll guard your heart and mind and protect it. Where you don't have the anxiety, you have a peace of God. Do you have a peace with God? Do your, do you, do your, do your problems go away? He didn't say your problems are going away. Do you claim victory all of a sudden? No, you still got to get up and go to work in the morning. You're still going to fail that test. You're still going to be pregnant. I mean, whatever the case may be, students, the baby's not going away. But he'll guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus and give you protection from the things that are still in your joy and your happiness in your life. We got to practice prayer. And quickly, my time's up. We got to capture our thoughts. We got to capture our thoughts finally. Now, this is, he, he, remember, he's a Baptist preacher. This is the second or third time he said, finally. I mean, he's finally going to wrap this letter up. He's he still got some more to go. Finally, he said, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You remember the anxiety? You remember the pray about everything? You remember we're going before God and making our request to God, all that kind of thing? Very next thought was capture your thoughts. Make your thoughts obedient to Christ and think about whatever is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. For some of you that are on the road every week, bless your heart, unbelievable. This week, we went to Montgomery and I went to Atlanta, came back to Birmingham, went to Montgomery, came back to Birmingham. And by the time I got home Thursday, I, I wanted to be a cussing maniac. These people that drive 90 miles an hour and they ride on your tail and all of a sudden they're there and then you're behind the person going 60 miles an hour, that drives me bonkers. You know, I really didn't cuss. It just made me mad. Drives me crazy. Drives me nuts. I mean, just... Would you, do, would you just at least get close to the speed limit? Don't drive 60 in the left lane, okay? And for you truck drivers, if your boat's pulling the hill, be patient. Don't clog up both. Tell them don't clog up both lanes, okay? Some of you get over. Help us out a little bit. Don't go 45 up the hill on 65. Driving me crazy. Man, we got problems. Have you watched the news lately? Do they think we're just stupid or what? Yes. That we're believing what they're telling us? Yeah. And the, I mean, does the president and the former president, does any, uh, any of them, I mean, would you just, come on. We, we got a brain. We, we, we can remember. I mean, we're going to, and, and then the Bible comes to us and has the audacity, but buddy, why don't you focus on what is true? Why don't you focus on what is noble? Why don't you focus on what is right? Why don't you focus on what is pure? And buddy, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Buddy, if anything in your life is excellent or praiseworthy, focus on that. So I get a 10 on that one. Because I struggle with that. I struggle with seeing everything that's wrong. I mean, there's sheetrock missing on the corner of this post. I mean, it drives me crazy. Y'all could care less, and it really doesn't matter, but it's going to be fixed. I mean, it's just, just and now it says, buddy, don't focus on the post. Don't. 
Focus on what is excellent and praiseworthy. Don't focus on the negative of your children. Focus on their, their strengths and their abilities and what they're doing well. And don't always berate them. Build them up. Focus. Capture your thoughts. So how you doing? Are you a one or a five or an eight or a, like me? F. Failure. Ten. Finally, let's go this morning. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, put it into practice. Live the life. Don't just hear the word, do what it says. Put it into practice. Don't, don't, don't just have an understanding, well, yeah, that's what the Bible says. Do it. Put it into practice. These verses that we've looked at today, leave this place and say, buddy, you've got to be more positive. You've got to see the good in life. You can't always focus on the negative life. You've got to find the good in life. Put it into practice. Because if you put it into practice, the very next word, and, and the peace of God will be with you. And if you'll just take this passage and this week do it, the peace of God will be with you. It transcends all understanding. It won't make sense, especially to the, to the worldly mind. It may not even make sense to you because you're still going to have things that ought to bring anxiety in your life, but you, you've let those at the throne of God because you've prayed about everything. Remember that we have peace of God when we have peace with God which leads to peace with others. It leads to peace with others. So are you living what you know to live? Don't worry about what you don't know to live. Are you doing what you know to do? Regardless of personality. We're not dealing with personality, we're dealing with presence because God is near to us. C.S. Lewis says you cannot have happiness and peace God cannot give us, excuse me, happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There's no such thing.